Another important set of groupings to understand in the periodic table is the distinction between metals, metalloids, and nonmetals. Traditionally, metals have been described as the lower and left elements of the periodic table. But I think an easier way to draw this distinction is just to remember how to recognize all the metalloids, recognize this sort of staircase that is drawn that represents all the metalloids, and then anything to the left of that other than hydrogen will be a metal, and anything to the right will be a nonmetal. Metals are distinctive because they have two qualities known as malleability and ductility. Malleability is the ability for it to change shape while still in a solid form. So for example, if you were to hit a metal with a hammer, it would deform slightly in response to that. Ductility is its ability to be stretched, or perhaps you can stretch it into a pipe or wire or tube or something along those lines. Metals are also notable because they have a shiny luster, a lot of times it's just referred to as a metallic luster, and they're useful because they conduct electricity and heat very well. And so metal has some very, very distinctive qualities that are useful in industry, for example. The nonmetals don't share that, but the metalloids are somewhat in between. Metalloids have some metallic qualities and some non-metal qualities, and they're also known as semiconductors. And this is very important in electronics because semiconductors let through a measurable, minimal amount of electricity. So whereas metals are purely conductive, semiconductors allow circuit makers a lot more control because they conduct electricity a lot less quickly and thus it's more measurable and it can be controlled a bit better. The transition metals are another group that's represented by this D block here. And they're called transition metals because they can transition between multiple ionization states. And so you might see iron 2, iron 3, and so on. Whereas a lot of things tend to ionize only one way, transition metals tend to ionize multiple ways because of the fact that they have this D orbital and also the S and P orbitals available. And so to fulfill Hund's rules of wanting either a completely filled subshell or a half filled shell, they can do it multiple ways by shifting electrons between S, D, and P orbitals. So the transition metals are most distinctive because of their ability to form multiple different cations. It's also good to be aware of the elements that can do multiple bonding, and there aren't many of them. They're all represented here. C, N, O, P, and S are the ones that you're most likely to encounter that do multiple bonds. Carbon and nitrogen are the ones that can make strong double and triple bonds. Both of those are very good at making that, and your cyanide compound, C, N, has a triple bond, and so that's the two of them doing something they do very well, which is making multiple bonds. Oxygen makes very, very strong double bonds, but does not do triple bonds because it has no desire to gain any additional electrons beyond those two that it would gain by bonding. Phosphorus and sulfur make weak double bonds, but they still are capable of multiple bonding, and so be aware that C, N, O, P, and S can all do multiple bonds, but very few other things are capable of even approaching a uh, pi bonded state. And finally, it's good to be aware of things that are diatomic in their natural state, meaning that it's just something C2, for example, or H2, or something along those lines. The ones that are naturally diatomic and prefer to be diatomic are hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and any of the halogens. So you have H, O, N, and any of the halogens here, those are the ones that form diatomic compounds like Cl2 or O2 very naturally. Other things can, but they're less likely to unless they're one of these groups there.